All right, here we are at the end of our journey through Heidegger's essay, uh, Art, or sorry, on art, the origin of the work of art. This should be the final video. It might go a little bit longer than the previous ones, but uh, we don't have a whole lot of material to cover, but it's pretty, like, as usual, in-depth stuff, so we're going to have to pause <laughs> occasionally throughout these long quotes to kind of unpack what's going on here in this essay towards the end. This is wrapping things up here, and he's drawing things to a close, and he, and he, and he starts to reflect on... Um, you know, some of the things you've already talked about, the nature of art, the nature of truth, the nature of a work, and also he brings up language now. So in this video, we're going to talk a bit about language and also poetry, because for Heidegger, in a certain sense, actually in a literal sense, he's going to say, all art is, is poetry in the sort of original essential meaning of that word, all art, whether you're talking about architecture or sculpture or music, it's all poetry in, in one form or another, right? Now, this might sound confusing. He's, to me, and to most people who know Heidegger, they're gonna say, look, he's, he's getting this out of the Greek conception, the, the notion of poetry, the, the word in Greek is poesis, and it originally means a bringing forth, right? A creation, right? The word poet, you know, if you've read the Apology, a lot, a lot of translations will um, use the word poet to refer to basically all artists. So when, when, when Socrates goes to talk to the poets and to question the poets, um, it's playwrights, you know, people like, uh, you know, that wrote plays and, and, and not just epic poems, right? But, the, you know, the people who do dithyrams, like these little folk songs. So those are all forms of poetry in the Greek mind. So, you know, obviously I think, you know, Heidegger's kind of going back to that original you know, where does the word come from? Poesis, okay? It's a bringing forth. And in that sense, all art is poetry. And, and, and the poetry that we're familiar with is, is in words. So obviously this sort of segues into a, a, um, a conversation about language, a reflection on language, and how art, poetry, and language relate. So that's going to be the main focus of this video. And then towards the end, we'll talk about you know, art as this cultural thing, as a cultural phenomenon, and how it affects culture. Is, is it just an artifact? Or, or is it actually, you know, as Heidegger wants to put it, sort of a guide, a measure, right? A, 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 a happening of truth in the work, right? That sets the stage for what's, what's possible and what's impossible, right? So that's going to be all in this, you know, one video. We'll see if we can, we can fit it in, into like less than 40 minutes. Uh, it's kind of a tall order. Um, but, you know, we, we might have to do an extra little concluding video. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but I better, without further ado, just dive right in because we've got a long quote right here. Here's where he brings up this notion of poetry. All art is poetry. So truth as the clearing and concealing of what is happens in being composed as a poet composes a poem. There's this, this talk of clearing and concealing and whatever. That should be familiar by this by this video. If you've watched the previous lectures, you know what he's talking about here. At least you have an inkling. So truth happens as, uh, as a poet composes a poem, right? Happens in being composed. Just like when a poet composes a poem. All art, all art, as the letting happen of the advent of the truth of what is, is as such essentially poetry. So take note of that. That's what he's. That's what he means by the by poetry, right? There's poetry in the more specific sense, what we think of poetry, right? Written words, in verse, or maybe not, right? But you know, you get the you you know we all have sort of an idea what poetry is. We've read a poem, but for him, poetry essentially is this letting happen of the advent of the truth of what is. Bringing forth, you know, something, and that something is, okay? So that's, that is essentially poetry. The nature of art, on which both the artwork and the artist depend, is the setting into the work of truth. It is due to art's poetic nature that, in the midst of what is, art breaks open an open place, in whose openness everything is other than usual. We talked about this 
in previous videos, particularly the last video more than any, right? The work of art, it breaks open an open place in whose openness everything is other than usual, right? So it comes into this world and it, and it, and it sets a precedent um, that has never been seen before. It's its own unique object and, and expands the realm of possibilities. And if it's completely groundbreaking, right? It's actually going to set up a new world, right? It's going to set up the possibility for a new world, a new clearing, a new engagement with beings, right? A new way of understanding things, right? If it has that, 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 that depth or that thrust on us, okay? So it's due to art's poetic nature that in the midst of what is, art breaks open an open place in whose openness everything is other than usual. By virtue of the projected sketch set into the work of the unconcealedness of what is, which casts itself towards us. Everything ordinary and hitherto existing becomes an unbeing, right? So in other words, the work of art makes us completely reevaluate, right? If it's, if it's that, if it sets up a world for us, it makes us reevaluate the truth of all that is. And some things are no longer relevant, right? Once, maybe once, once a work of art brings some sort of truth forward, um, it sort of, it unconceals something that was previously concealed and it shows the flaws in a previous way of seeing things so that we can never see them that way ever again. He's going to give us a few examples of this. So I, I should just go ahead and I'll finish the quote and, and, and then we'll get to you know, some of the examples he gives of, of, of different ways of seeing the world th through the work, right? And different, different uh, uh, ways of being and how some things that were hitherto existing now become an unbeing, right? Something that doesn't count as having being. Um, this is this unbeing has lost the capacity to give and to keep being as measure, right? It no longer is relevant in the new regime. It's no longer relevant in this new way of seeing, this new way of existing, this new way of dwelling on the earth in our world. The working of the work, or sorry, the curious fact here is that the work in no way affects hitherto existing entities by causal connections. So it doesn't, it's not, it's not a causal thing. It's not like a fire, you know, that lights the building and causes the horrible, you know, uh, scourge of the town, right? It's not a causal change, right? The working of the work does not consist in the taking effect of a cause. It lies in a change happening from out of the work of the unconcealedness of what is. And this means of being right again so it's it's it, it changes the world but not in a causal sense it actually changes the way in which we reflect and see and perceive what is and how it is and what counts as existing and and not existing and to what extent right so again it's a change that happens from out of the work of the unconcealedness of what is right it changed to the openness of what is so how does this tie into language? Okay, he's gonna make some remarks about language. Obviously, poetry is something that, you know, uh, the sort of typical understanding of poetry is something that involves language, words on paper, right? In a book, in verse. So he's gonna talk about the, na the nature of language in general, and then kind of come back around to it, a roundabout way to poetry and, and art itself, all art as poetry, essentially. So what about language? In the current view, language is held to be a kind of communication. It serves for verbal exchange and agreement, and in general for communicating. But language is not only and not primarily an audible and written expression of what is to be communicated. It not only puts forth in words and statements what is overtly or covertly intended to be communicated. Language alone brings what is, as something that is, into the open for the first time, where there is no language, as in the being of a stone, plant, an animal, there is also no openness of what is, and consequently no openness either of that which is not and of the empty. So what is he saying here about language? Um, this tacks on nicely to some of his comments that he said earlier <clears throat> about how, you know, when we was talking about a world and he was saying that a plant and an animal, a stone are worldless, 
they don't have a world the way we do. We have a world as, as distinguished from the earth, a world of <clears throat> human significance, right? Of institutions, cultural, political, social. And this world has a certain openness to it. There's a, a realm of infinite possibilities of all these things that I can be given the world that I inhabit. Whereas if I'm a, a bird, I'm just a bird. Like I'm going to be a bird and build a nest and try to make other birds with other birds, right? That's it, right? But as a human, I'm like I want to be an artist or I want to be a musician. And, and now there's such a thing as an astronaut. That's a new thing of, that's a new form of being that didn't exist a hundred years ago. Now I can be an astronaut. That's another way I could exist or be in the world. That's a certain openness, okay? So what is he saying about language here? Animals don't have language, right? Now, again, you know, maybe, maybe you want to push back on this. I know they've done a lot of scientific studies that animals can communicate and, you know, they, they, they you know, uh, apes, uh, you know, simians, they, 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 they're able to uh, distinguish and use, use gestures and sounds to communicate all sorts of things. <clears throat> but for Heidegger, that's, okay, that's communication. But that, for him, language, that's, that's something that language can do. But what language is, is something much more deep than that right? It has a lot more to do with this openness to the world. It's not like this message in the bottle, right? Where I'm this, in, this individual that has this message to send to somebody right out there in the, you know, apart from me. And I just sort of put, put my message out there using words or on paper and I put out, and I hope that they somehow get what I'm saying, right? And that, that, that the message is communicated, right? But for Heidegger, there's more, there's more to it than that. That what's going on in language, in a certain sense, and he doesn't use the term world here, but he's got this in mind, obviously, with this talk of openness. Now, when we use language, it, it you know, in, in a certain sense, we inhabit language. Language is, reveals our world. We, we, we reveal our world through language, right? Language, the way language is, is in our lives, it's a phenomenon uh, that lets us express things to other people. Uh, to understand things. And so the fact that we communicate through language, right, is a result of the fact that we have a shared world. Language is this world, right? We, we are sort of, we, we are beings that inhabit our language. We dwell in our language, maybe is a word that Heidegger would, would rather uh, sort of use. We, it's not that we use it. Sure, we can. Uh, but when we do that, right, we're, we're sort of, again, as he puts it, um, that we put forth words and statements uh, overtly, covertly, but language alone brings what is as something that is into the open for the first time, right? So it's not a part of our world. It's not a part of a community unless it's able to be spoken or said of, right? Unless somebody else can understand it. And what that means is that we have this shared reality. We have this shared space in which these words have significance. We have this shared space of the system of symbols and meanings and significance. And, and historically, these, these change. Different words have different meanings uh, in different historical spaces. Some words no longer exist that were used before languages die out. But a language is a reflection or you know, a revealing of the culture, the world, the perspective, the outlook of it. It is the world. It is, in a certain sense, we are our language, right? It is the realm of possibilities in, in, in a certain sense. Uh, Heidegger might even say it. Uh, take it to that extreme. Poetry. Now back to poetry. Poetry is the saying of the unconcealedness of what is. Actual language at any given moment is the happening of this saying. Okay, so <clears throat> poetry, I guess Heidegger is saying here, you know, if we're talking about poetry as a bringing forth, you know, whether it's, you know, in a very, this broad sense, as he put it, it's a saying of the unconcealedness of what is, right? So poetry, because it allows the word to be a word, for us to just appreciate it as a written word, instead of seeing a function, you know, well, what is the artist trying to say? Well, no, we're just appreciating the beauty of the poem and how the words flow together, maybe the rhyme, the mood that it evokes in us. We're not using it as, as, as a message or an instruction manual, right? That's not really the point of the poem, Heidegger's going to argue. Right? What the poem does, what poetry and what art in general does, right? if art is poetry, it's a saying, right? it's, a, it's a telling of the unconcealedness of what it is. It shows you that world. It shows you the way that things are unconcealed and revealed to us. Right? It brings that to the fore. It strikes you that way. So actual language, the language that we just use sort of at any given moment, 
is a happening of this saying. We're living it. We're working it out, right? This truth that is in the work of art is something that we live and that we exist and that we, we make manifest in the way that we hold our spoon or put the napkin in our lap or say excuse me or all these sort of mundane things that are a part of this significant world that we inhabit, right? Language is a, is, is a happening of this saying that is, that is made explicit well maybe explicit is not the right word but is 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 unconcealed in poetry right it's a saying of this unconcealedness <clears throat> so again actual language at any given moment is a happening of this saying in which a people's world historically arises for it and the earth is preserved as that which remains closed right here's the earth again right so so language you know it's a happening of the saying of poetry, right? The truth that is revealed within the, the poetic expression of art, the world in which we inhabit. Language is, is a working out, is a lived experience of this, right? Is an inhabiting of that space, okay? In which, as he puts it, a people's world historically arises for it and in which the earth is preserved as that which remains closed, right? There's always that unknown element, that that impenetrable earth, right? As much as we try to survey it, as much as we try to understand it, brute fact, brute nature is always going to sort of leave something unanswered, right? Projective saying is saying which in preparing the sayable simultaneously brings the unsayable as such into a world. So we talked about, I've already sort of alluded to this earlier in the video, and I think maybe in the last video, that the work of art brings something into the world that was previously unsayable, right? Something that was, the world itself didn't have space for, right? That it had never been said before. And because of the way the world was structured, it, maybe it was, it was not obvious. And in, in fact, maybe not even possible to say it. The work of art brings this, this possibility uh, into the open for the first time, right? So in such a saying, he says, you know, when it brings the unsayable into such a world, such a saying, the concept of an historical people's nature, in other words, if it's belonging to world history, are formed for that folk before it, okay? So, the, the, what, and, and maybe, you know, for me, I think Heidegger, you know, his standard here is pretty high for art. If, if art is supposed to do this, it, all art, I don't know if he's saying all works of art are supposed to do this, um, that's a pretty high standard, right? That, that art is supposed to transport us to make us aware of our world and in its greatest and most um, excellent sense, the, the greatest works of art are going to completely move history, right? We're going to see things differently. We're going to see possibilities differently. And in fact, it's going to shape our history. It's going to shape our identity as a cultural people. Poetry is thought of here in so broad a sense, right? So he, again, he's applying it to everything. Poetry is this bringing forth. Uh, how does he put it exactly? Um, it's a letting happen of the advent of truth of what is, okay? So poetry is thought of here in so broad a sense, a bring, an advent of the bringing forth of truth of what is, right? So broad. And at the same time, in such intimate unity of being with language and word that we must leave open whether art in all its modes from architecture to poesy exhausts the nature of poetry right you know so he's i think he's sort of anticipating his reader to be a bit of a skeptic here right it's like all art is poetry architecture is poetry what everything okay what are you talking about right how is this building like how is this language this structure's you know it's an amazing work of art here right <clears throat> this the great court in the british museum this is amazing right um how is this poetry how is this language how is this the um as he puts it bringing forth right um as he put it, the, the, the letting happen, sorry, of the advent of truth of what is. How is that, how is that in, in, in a building, right? Well, language itself is poetry in the essential sense. If language is, as he truly says, this revealing of a world, right? If language is, is this, uh, you know, place where what is as something what as something that is is in the open for the first time 
once people can say it, communicate about it, talk about it, express it, see it, understand it, be a part of it together, once it's, it, that, that means it's in language and that means it's a part of our world. Okay, so if that's the case, right, if language itself is poetry in this essential sense, right, the essential sense, right, the letting happen of the advent of truth of what is, if language is that, if it's, if it's poetry in the essential sense, then architecture is poetry, and sculpture is poetry, and the painting of Van Gogh is poetry, right? So he does, he thinks this, the language itself is poetry, but, but, since language is the happening in which for man, beings first disclose themselves to him each time as beings, right? Since, since language is what allows a certain thing to really inhabit what we would call a world in the Heideggerian sense, right? It is the most original form of poetry in the essential sense, right? Poesy is the most original form of poetry in the essential sense. Let me back up and reread that. I really kind of misfired on that. So again, language itself is poetry in the essential sense. But since language is the happening in which for man, beings first disclose themselves to him each time as beings, as an existing thing, poesy, or poetry in the narrower sense, in the most original form of poetry, sorry, is the most original form of poetry in the essential sense, okay? So what we think of as poetry, reading a poem out of a book, is the most original form of this bringing forth, right? Because, because it's, it's, it's a form of language, I think, is his sort of argument here. Because poetry, you know, sort of the, the traditional understanding of poetry, you know, the William Blake, the Shakespeare sonnets, the Homer, po the epic poems of uh, Homer, you know, for him, that's the original form of poetry, not just in its own sense, the, the sort of standard version, the standard definition that we go with, but it's the original form of poetry in this broader sense, in the sense of, you know, I keep having to go back to this quote because I keep forgetting the letting happen of the advent of truth of what is, okay? So it's, it's the first time, you know, that's the first form of, of, of the poetry, uh, poetry proper, the way we talk about it, is the original form of poetry in this broader Heideggerian sense. Um, and, and language itself is, is, is a happening of this saying, of this advent of truth, right? It's a working out. It's, again, we inhabit language. That's why I love this little drawing here. People walking through the city, it's just a bunch of words. The buildings are made out of words, right? The world we inhabit, right, is there because we have a language and language in the super broad sense of sharing a, a, a shared system of meanings, a shared system of, of, um, of symbols and meanings and significance and possibilities, and all this stuff, right? This in a, in a very broad sort of naked sense is speaking language, you know, in, in, in this Heideggerian sense, a sort of openness to what's possible and a realm of possibility that's, that's set forth through language. So building, he says, and plastic creation, right? Even though they're forms of poetry too, right? They're only possible through the, this, what, he's, what he's calling language here, right? Th this openness to beings that we all partake in, right? We all share a common language, whether we're speaking English together or German or whatever, right? And even then, even if we speak different languages, different tongues, we know we, we, we deal with the same problems like international trade. And, you know, we're part of the same world essentially, right? And so there's a sort of system of references and understandings, okay? The fact that there's a system of references and understandings and all that that is, that, is, that is alive and living and lived every day through our language, that is the basis for all other poetry, you know, in the sense of creating and bringing forth, uh, such as building, he says, plastic creation. These always happen already and happen only in the open, right, the realm of possibility of saying and naming. It is the open, right, this realm of possibility that pervades and guides them. But for this very reason, they remain their own ways and modes in which truth orders itself into work. They are an ever special poeticizing within the clearing of what is, 
which has already happened unnoticed in language, okay? So uh, language is a clearing in the sense that the work of art can clear an open space, but it's, it goes unnoticed, right? We, we, we sort of evolve to these creatures that can speak and can share a world through our language, through our, commu our communicative uh, capacity, right? Our ability to speak and to share understandings as best we can. Right, as, as flawed, as imperfect creatures as we are, we're able to do this. We're able to inhabit this space meaningfully, right? Again, it's, it's, it's perfect, it's a mess, but we're able to deal with it and, 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 and uh, you know, not have it completely fall apart to chaos. I mean, who knows how much longer that's gonna, 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 gonna go, but <laughs> we'll see, right? I won't digress on that, that whole discussion. That's, that's something for another video. But anyways, the point he's making here, though, is that, that um, the fact that these works of art can, can, um, can change that, can change our comportment to being, is based on the fact that we even have a world to begin with. And the fact that we have a world to begin with is only possible because we're able to have a language and we're able to inhabit language in this sort of way, right? The open as he puts it, pervades and guides us, right? And it's only, <clears throat> it's only the, 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 sorry, it can only happen in the open of saying and naming. Whatever does happen, whatever is created can only happen within this realm of possibilities. Um, so art as the setting into work of truth is poetry, he wants to say. <clears throat> not only on the sorry not only the creation of the work is poetic right not only is it a sort of bringing forth but equally poetic through its own way is the preserving of the work we talked about that in the video that we just finished right was it video 12 the last video right the, the preserving is just as essential to the work as the creating right uh, for a work in its actual effect as a work um sorry for a work is in actual effect as a work only when we remove ourselves from our commonplace routine and move into what is disclosed by the work so as to bring our own nature itself to take a stand in the truth of what is right we remove ourselves from the commonplace as he puts it when we see this work of architecture right we're struck by it's 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 you know, we're, we're in awe look at all the material that was made and how it was organized this is incredible we're no longer seeing it as functional. We're no longer the people on the stairs walking around it. We're, you know, this is maybe a good metaphor for, for language, right? When we're using language, we're like the people on the stairs here in the picture, okay? They're walking through the corridors. They're maybe on their way to their office or something like that. They're not thinking of the building as a building. They're not thinking of the space as a built space. They're just, they, maybe they have to work, they're getting back from their lunch break and they've got this uh, report they got to file. And they're like, oh my goodness, I've never had an office job. So I, I, I'm just sort of like stumbling on examples here. But he, they're lost in their in their day-to-day -day mundane tasks, right? But when they sort of, maybe once they first walk into the lobby and they look up at this, this towering, uh, you know, a giant of, of, of a structure with its with its form and its beauty the earth juts out right they see the the metal and the reflection and all this stuff um and then they, they think about it as a building and why was it built and geez man this is huge and all the the stuff that went into it okay and and why are we doing this why are we going to work every day why do we spend all this money on these beautiful buildings and everybody's starving so again like again it, it, it who knows what our reaction could be it could be that it could be something else but but again it removes us from our commonplace routine as he puts it and we move into what is disclosed by the work what what does it just state in its in its rawness right as it stands in itself and that sort of it brings our own nature itself to take a stand in the truth of what is so he sees poetry um, as a kind of and, and this shouldn't be too much of a surprise given all the things he said about art and the work of art so far, he sees all poetry, all bringing forth all art as a founding, right? Uh, as he puts the founding of truth, okay? The work of art reveals a truth that was hidden, that was, that was concealed. It brings it to the fore and it lets us understand it for the first time as it is. We see the being in its being as a being, right? And so it gives us this new outlook and in a certain sense, it's a founding, it's a foundation. And for him to found something, there's sort of three things that that entails, okay? Founding, we can understand it as a bestowing, we can understand it as a grounding, 
and we can also understand it as a beginning. And he wants to say that the work, insofar as it's poetry, insofar as the work of art is poetic, is a founding in all three senses of the word. Okay, so what, what, is, what does he mean by a bestowing, right? So he says that, you know, the work of art discloses itself, sorry, truth discloses itself in the work that can never be proved or derived from, went from what went before. So we see something in the work of art that given our way of being, given our, uh, our current situation in the world, we would have no way of thinking this way. We'd have no way of understanding beings in this light. But when we see this work, it's able to, to sort of take us out of our commonplace, to take us out of our mundane tasks, and to kind of like reflect on this possibility. And in that sense, it discloses something that was never, that we never could have thought of before, it never could have been derived from previous modes of thought. And so in that sense, it's a bestowing. It's like a gift that the artist is giving. Hey, here's a new way that truth is revealed, right? It's also a grounding, right? Because he says in poetic projection, the previous closed ground is first grounded as the bearing ground. So, so once this work of art is, is put out into the world and it, it discloses something that was never thought of before, wasn't even conceivable before, now it's, as he says, this previously closed ground that, that was you know, unable to be accessed is now accessed as something that's a foundation for more like it. Now, now I'm like, oh wow, that is possible. I can do an artwork kind of like that too. I, I didn't think that was, you, you could do that, but apparently you can. And it's also a beginning, right? So it's, it's, it's a founding in the sense of a beginning and a beginning for him, he, he characterizes this as, a, as really a head start uh, in which as he puts it, everything to come is already leaped over. So in a sense, the, the artwork uh, is almost prophetic. It, it kind of, it, it anticipates what will follow it anticipates maybe its place in its historic place and sort of where where history is headed where where our world is is being shaped and how it's being shaped okay um okay so this is all very vaguely stated let's try to unpack this here right art again it's a founding um he says the setting into work of truth thrusts itself up the unfamiliar and extraordinary, and at the same time thrust down the ordinary that we believe to be such. The truth that discloses itself in the work can never be proved or derived from what went before. What went before is refuted in its exclusive reality by the work. What art founds can therefore never be compensated and made up for by what is already present and available. Founding is an overflow, an endowing, a bestowal, right? It's, it's a gift of the artist, okay? So this is all very vaguely stated. What is he talking about here? How does the, you know, when, when a work is setting up truth that thrusts the unfamiliar and extraordinary, at the same time it thrusts down the ordinary, Okay, I've got a picture of, uh, <clears throat> you know, a, a paste up uh, by Shepard Fairey. Okay, so Shepard Fairey's fairly famous street artist, right? Uh, does graffiti art and, and street art like this. <clears throat> He's most famous for doing the Obama, the sort of iconic hope image of Obama, right? When Obama was running for president the first time. But he's also really famous for this obey image, okay? <clears throat> How is this work, you know, I want to argue that in this work, what Ferry is doing, he's thrusting up the unfamiliar and extraordinary, and he's thrusting down the ordinary, which we believe to be such, okay? As, as Heidegger puts it, the, the truth discloses itself, can never be proved or derived from what went before, and what went before is refuted in its exclusive reality by the work. How is that true in the work of Shepard Ferry? Maybe Heidegger wouldn't agree with me on this, but I would argue that it's true. What Shepard Ferry and artists like Banksy have done, these street artists, these graffiti artists, is that they, they've legitimized what was once seen as vandalism, right? People would always say, that's not art, that's vandalism. They're defacing property. This is, you know, that's, 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 that's horrible, these, these rebels, right? And for years, right? I mean, it wasn't until 
very, very recently. Um, I, I don't want to put an, a year on it, and, and, and there's still people that don't appreciate it, right? There's still – there was some guy who uh, – famously uh i forget the whole story but he he um you know banksy was kind of trolling him i think because he kept uh erasing banksy's paintings or his graffiti and banksy would just sort of like put it up the next day and the guy would clean it and then put it up the next day and then he started kind of like adding little messages and kind of screwing with the guy kind of trolling him uh but anyway so what once shepherd fairy and once banksy bring these works it, 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 in, a, in a way it thrusts up the unfamiliar the, you know we see a piece of graffiti and oh that's art that's junk that that's not art that's junk that's defacing property but now we're like oh no look it's cool it looks nice it actually adds character it's a part of you know our world now it's actually it's actually something that's possible okay and it ref, it refutes that that previous understanding right what went before is refuted in its exclusive reality right oh no no that's just graffiti now it's that that sort of view of seeing things is is challenged right so so founding is is a bestowal right he brings the possibility and no no graffiti can be art okay so you know what you call graffiti what you call vandalism this is actually art okay <clears throat> And so again, it's it's a grounding. There's nothing that ever came before. Before this was not not in the category of art, and now art is redefined. Right? There's an overflow, uh, as 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 he puts it. Right? <clears throat> and now other people can be street artists. So it's also grounding. It's also a, a founding in the sense of a grounding. It's a bestowing. There's something new, but it's also a grounding because now, oh hey man, I used to be just I thought I was a vandal, but now I actually do graffiti as I'm an artist, you know, and 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 so it's it, it's also a grounding. It's a ground on which other art can be made. How is it a beginning though too? Right, art can be founding as a beginning. Okay, so bestowing and grounding have in themselves the unmediated character of what we call a beginning. Okay, so what does Heidegger mean by a beginning here? How is a work of art a beginning? Um, so he says this unmediated character of a beginning, the peculiarity of a leap out of the unmediable, right? That's which we can't understand or mediate or make sense of, right? This leap out of that. It does not exclude, but rather includes the fact that the beginning prepares itself for the longest time and wholly inconspicuously. A genuine beginning as a leap is always a head start in which everything to come is already leaped over, even if as something disguised. The beginning already contains the end latent within it. Now, I'm guessing most people are not familiar with the work of Chrome, who I have pictured here. They look rather grim and dark in that photo at the bottom, Damon Edge and Helios Creed in 1980. Right after they got done recording, actually, I think a Half Machine Lip Moves, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, I think that album was first released in 1978. So that photo is a couple years after they released this LP. But they did another one called Alien Soundtracks. But those two albums, Alien Soundtracks, Half Machine Lip Moves, these were these were very obscure underground works. They still are. Chrome does not have a big following. Never did. I know Helios Creed. Uh, he's still touring occasionally. I think he finally was able to re-release all this stuff because it was out of print for so many years. But they had a big influence, right? They were using. Uh, ADAT tape recorders, these digital tape recorders to use samples. They, they were using hev heavy samples, electronics, and they used uh, a lot of um, effects on their guitar work. And this, this had a big impact and big influence on a lot of subsequent music. Uh, and so you could argue, I mean, the, these, are, the, these albums are, by most people's standards, way ahead of their time. I mean, incredibly ahead of their time. I mean, in 1978, 1979, if you listen to these albums, you would not believe they were recorded in the late 70s. You would think they were recorded pretty recent, you know, uh, because it's just, I mean, it's just ridiculous, you know? So there's something that in this that's, um, it, it, it provides the basis for something new though. Now, Chrome, Compared to people like, you know, I've got here the Butthole Surfers, right, who are a band from Austin, right, and, and they, they're, not, they're not really around anymore, I think. They, they play shows occasionally, but they don't tour anymore. As far as I know, they're not really recording any albums or planning on it. 
but you know, the butthole surfers were, were, you know, they, they claim, they said they were highly influenced by Chrome and you hear their sound develop, but bands like butthole surfers, there's one example, all sorts of other genres and music sort of developed from this, this sort of scene, you know, the, the Chrome were from San Francisco Bay area, but you had a lot of experimental art, post punk and all that kind of stuff. And you could, you could see, the influence of the sort of elements, the sort of the heavy guitar work matched with the electronics, sort of the, the digital electronic sound, all that together influenced subsequent acts like Ministry and Butthole Surfers. And, you know, the list goes on and on and on, all sorts of art, right? So again, this beginning is a head start. That's why they're ahead of their time, right? They, they foresaw, you, you listen to this music that was recorded 30 years ago, and it sounds like it was recorded today. It's because they, they kind of, they saw sort of where everything was going they had there was this there's this truth that they were able to bring forth right so a, a beginning on the contrary always contains the undisclosed abundance of the unfamiliar and the extraordinary which means that it also contains strife with the familiar and ordinary art as poetry is founding in the third sense of instigation of the strife of truth founding as beginning always when that which is as a whole demands as what is itself a grounding and openness art attains to its historical nature as foundation <clears throat> okay let me reread that last line because i think i kind of botched it so always when that which is as a whole demands as what it is itself a grounding and openness art attains to its historical nature as a foundation okay so so the historical nature of art is a founding we've already you know kind of discussed this i think enough um but always when that which is what is existing as a whole right that world structure that we all inhabit right whenever that which is demands a grounding and openness and you know an availability and, and openness you know art attains its historical nature as a foundation, right? When, when, when Chrome, when Helios Creed and Damon Edge are living in the late seventies in the Bay area in San Francisco, and they're not happy with, with their life. They're not happy with the art that they see. They think that the punk movement was a disappointment that it's supposed to be all rebellious and crazy, but it's just, just same old rock and roll, but just a little faster, a little bit more angry, a little bit more, you know, in your face, but you know, they want to do something really groundbreaking, really crazy. Look at all the, the technology we, have all the new uh, modes of, of, of recording and, and equipment and, and things we have at our fingertips let's stop just trying to like use this new fangled you know synthesizer to recreate old music why are we using synthesizers to play Bach that's stupid Bach was a, a product of his time you know, let's do something new with this material. And once they open up that space, right, this is a foundation, right? This is a historical foundation for subsequent modes of being, a new grounding in openness, okay? And so for Heidegger, this kind of foundation, this happening, right, this art as a founding happened in the West for the very first time in Greece. I think he's very much in line with philosophers like Nietzsche. And maybe they give too much credit to the ancient Greeks, okay? But they're going to say that this foundation, this using the work, works of art as a kind of founding happened in the West originally in Greece. What was in the future, you know, after, after the early Greeks, what was in the future to be called being was set into work, setting the standard. The realm of beings thus opened up was then transformed into a being in the sense of God's creation. This happened in the Middle Ages. So we go from the Greek understanding of being, right? The, the, the Greek world shifts into the medieval world, the Middle Ages, right? Where being is not understood in the sense of fusis, as Heidegger puts it, as a sort of coming forth or a, or a sort of outburst or a bringing forth or a jutting forth. Uh, but now being is seen as created, right? Being is created, namely God's creation. And all things have their being insofar as they're related to a part of God, right? As insofar as they are God's creation, right? And that, that mode of being, that way of being was transformed. This kind of being was again transformed at the beginning and in the course of the modern age, when you get to, uh, you know, let's say Copernicus and Kepler and Galileo, right? Uh, in that, and, then that, and then beings became objects that could be controlled and seen 
by calculation, seen through by calculation. At each time, a new and essential world arose. Okay, so the Greeks had their world. The Middle Ages, the medieval people had their world. The moderns, we moderns, are the post-Copernicans, we have our world. Okay, at each time, the openness of what is had to be established in beings themselves by the fixing in place of truth and figure right it, by that in that rift design that he talks about right the openness of what is had to be established in beings namely these works of art themselves by fixing in place the truth in figure right you know remember for heidegger art is a setting in tr you know setting into the work of truth a happening of truth at each time there happened an unconcealedness of what is unconcealedness sets itself to work a setting which is accomplished by art art as founding is historical essentially historical this means not only that art has a history in the external sense that in the course of time it too appears along with many other things and in this process changes and passes away and offers changing aspects for historiology art is history in the essential sense that it crowns history right so when heidegger says that that, that uh, art is historical he wants us to understand here it's not you know a, a, a sequence in time of events of whatever sort however important right but uh, we had this art movement the impressionist and then you had the post impressionist and then you had the you know the expressionist and the abstract expressionist and then you had the dadaist and you know, yeah sure yeah you can think of art in that sense as a part of a, a sequence of events but he wants us to understand it in a much deeper sense that art is history in the essential sense that it grounds history, right? It's a way of bringing truth, right? Bringing truth into being, right? In the work, bringing, setting forth, sorry, setting forth the earth and setting up a world, right? It's the, tr as he puts it, it's the transporting of a people into its appointed task as entrance into that people's endowment, right? It makes us aware of the worldly creatures that we are and the world we inhabit makes us reflect on it and our our appointed task in this process we inquire into the nature of art why do we inquire in this way so he's now he's asking why do we give a crap about art right why is it important why why do we waste all this time in this essay now we're starting to finally get to the end of it why what who cares about art right a lot of people don't you know, you know, I, I, a lot of, most people that I talk to when I, when I talk about my passions and you like to go to art museums, really? I, mean, I got, I go to art opening. Sure. Yeah. Cause there's alcohol. It's like a party. Uh, there's there's going to be a DJ there. Is it going to be drinks? You know, people are like, all right, who gives a crap about art? Why should we spend all this time thinking about art? Well, here's Heidegger's answer, right? And I don't know if it's going to be the clearest answer, but why? Why do we ask about the nature of art? Why do we inquire this way? We inquire in this way in order to be able to ask more truly whether art is or is not an origin in our historical existence, whether and under what conditions it can and must be an origin. And such reflection cannot force art and its coming to be. But this reflective knowledge is the preliminary and therefore indispensable preparation for the becoming of art. Only such knowledge prepares its space for art, their way for the creators, their location for the preservers. So what is he saying here? Why, why should we care about art? Well, we want to be able to be, be, you know, more truly understand it as an origin right to be able to actually let it work to actually have this effect on us and to know under what conditions it can be this right what under what conditions does a work of art actually do this actually work as a founding as a foundation as an opening up of a, a possibilities of the way that beings can be so we have to understand that art has this capacity because if we don't know that we won't be ready for it right 
and 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 the fact that we we've, we've gone through all this stuff for Heidegger, it, it doesn't mean that we can force art to happen, right? This is not an essay. He's not expecting artists to read this essay and go out and make art according to his standard, right? It's not going to force art and it's coming to be. But as he puts it, this knowledge, this reflective knowledge, this thinking about art and the nature of art, it's a preliminary. It's a preliminary. It's it's a prerequisite. And it's indispensable for art to be art, for art to do what art has done, to have this movement, to, to, to have this significance, to have this impact, to open up the space that it does. In order for that to be a thing, for that to be possible, we have to be aware that it is possible. So this knowledge prepares its space for art, the way for the creators, the way, the location for the preservers. In such knowledge, which can only grow slowly, right? We have to sort of, you know, we can't just sort of anticipate it. We can't just, oh, is that it? Is that art? Is that, is that work? Is that what he's talking about, right? It's something that, that, that's, that, that is maybe somewhat insidious, who knows? <clears throat> but in such knowledge, right, in such preparation for art, which can only grow slowly, the question is decided whether art can be an origin and then must be a head start or whether it is to remain a mere appendix and then can only be carried along as a routine cultural phenomenon. Heidegger, I think, is scared about this. Yeah, I, I, and I think he shares this concern with Nietzsche. This didn't really come to the fore in our exploration of Nietzsche because it's, it's really not something he talks about in, 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 in Birth of Tragedy so much, but you'll find it in his later work. And I think that Heidegger and Nietzsche share this concern. Has art become something that it is not? In other words, all this great stuff they're talking about, you know, how art reveals truth for Heidegger or how art is a reflection of culture for Nietzsche, right? Uh, it has this sort of, you know, it, it, it not only is a reflection of culture, but it, it's a guide for culture, right? It sort of gives us hopes and dreams and a sort of framework and a structure within which we can have morality, we can have, we can have values, right? They're both, I think, concerned with the, the fact that this might no longer be the case, right? Now art has become, as Heidegger puts it, a routine cultural phenomenon, right? We've got this Norman Rockwell painting here of the, the art connoisseur, right? I'm going to go appreciate art, and then I'm going to go have a picnic in the park, and then I'm going to go home and watch a movie. And it, you know, so it, it doesn't have that thrust that Heidegger speaks of, right? doesn't transport us. It doesn't present truth. The truth is not at work in this case, right? He mentions this quote from Hegel, and Hegel seems to sort of think, yeah, it's over, right? This game of art is over. Art as truth, not, not anymore. So what does Hegel say, right? Hegel was a big influence on Heidegger, so you know, even though I don't, think, I don't think Heidegger wants Hegel to be right, Heidegger still thinks maybe he is, maybe he is. But what does Heidegger say? Art, art no longer counts for us, Hegel says. Art no longer counts for us as the highest manner in which truth obtains existence for itself. One may well hope that art will continue to advance and perfect itself, but its form has ceased to be the highest need of the spirit. In all these relationships, art is and remains for us on the side of its highest vocation, something past. So for Hegel, art must have at one point in history served this function of drawing together our, our culture, I mean, giving us a framework from which we can sort of inhabit a space that has meaning and purpose, a world in other words. But it no longer does this, right? This is something of the past. And Heidegger asked the question, is art still, is it still an essential and necessary way in which that truth happens, which is decisive? for our historical existence? Or is art no longer of this character? If, however, it is such no longer, then there remains the question why this is so. The truth of Hegel's judgment has not yet been decided. So for, for Heidegger, you know, we can't answer this question yet, but it does remain a question. It is a relevant question. And the fact that it's a relevant question, right? That's something we need to ask. You know, if art doesn't have this, if it no longer has this function, why? Why not? What's happened? 
The foregoing reflections are concerned with the riddle of art, the riddle that art itself is. They are far from claiming to solve the riddle. The task is to see the riddle. So Heidegger's not defining art. That's not the point of this essay. The point is for us to reflect on art. And at the end of the essay, we have to reflect on the role of art in society and the role that it plays in our conception of the world and truth. And much to, I think, Heidegger's lamentation, this is an open question, right? Does it affect us in this way? Right? Maybe not. <laughs> this ties in a lot to his critique of technology, which I won't get into because this is the, the class that we're covering. This is all philosophy of art. But before I get to, to my sort of closing remarks and kind of wrapping things up for the course, let's kind of wrap things up with Heidegger. You know, what are some problems here? I think I've mentioned this a few times throughout these lectures. As much as I admire Heidegger and his thought, I really like some of the stuff that he says, thought-provoking work. You know, there's, I, I still have my gripes, and you may too, right? I hope you do. I hope, I hope you've got your own gripes with, with some of this stuff. One thing I think is he's a little too specified, right? It seems like, every, you know, does every work of art have to do this? Does every work of art have to set forth the world, or sorry, set forth the earth and set up a world? <clears throat> right? It almost seems like his um, theory is too specific. It's too specified, right? It's like not much will count for that, right? Like that's a pretty high standard. Um, this is kind of the opposite problem that we saw with Dewey. I think Dewey, John Dewey's theory of art, I would argue, is too general. It's too broad. You know, it, it makes, uh, you know, cooking a meal at home and being satisfied at the end of it, a work of art or a piece of performance art, maybe, right? And, and, and we might think that's, uh, that's not really art. It, has, it maybe has certain feature, you know? So it seems like Dewey's theory, if it's taken to its extreme, is too general, but maybe Heidegger, it's too specific, right? Again, does art, does art always have, you know, does, does the work always have this quality of founding and beginning and setting to, tr to, to, to work truth, right? Um, also, you might make the sort of um, opposite claim about his theory of art in that it's not specific enough when it comes to other things, right? So it's, it's a little too specialized. It's a little too narrow. Uh, things only count as a work of art if they have these pretty grandiose properties. They really move us and they have this thrust that he talks about. But when it comes to like determining whether or not a work of art lives up to this standard, and under what conditions this standard is met, he's not really that clear about it. He just gives us a few examples of works of art, the Greek temple, the poem, uh, the Roman fountain poem, the uh, Van Gogh painting, but he doesn't really lay out any sort of specific standards. Now, of course, he's probably gonna say, well, of course we can't do that, right? This is not what art, art sort of brings to the fore something that is not able to be expressed in terms of standards or whatnot. So perhaps, you know, the fact that I want him to bring me some standards and some conditions under which these standards can be met is actually a problem with me, not a problem with his theory, right? I'm thinking of art in the wrong way uh, is probably what his response to that would be. And again, another problem you might think is that, well, isn't there a way in which artworks can still be beautiful? They can still work in the sense of, you know, I'm not saying beautiful in, 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 in the general sense, but beautiful in the specific sense that he means it, right? Um, can't they be beautiful? Don't we actually, aren't we struck by them and, and think of them as objects of beauty? Aren't there other conceptions of beauty besides this, this work that he's talking about, this workly character of the, the work of art? In, in other words, this setting forth of the earth and this, the, 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 um, the setting up of a world. Um, and again, this is a question that he himself admits needs to kind of remain an open question. He's not quite sure the answer. I think he seems to sort of be leaning towards the negative answer. He doesn't want to, but is art really something that is no longer relevant in the sense that he thinks it's relevant, right? Is his understanding of art something of the past, right? Do we care about art the way the Greeks cared about the Parthenon? Right? Do we appreciate a great work of art and, and have it affect us and be a part of our world and reveal the world to us in the way the Parthenon did to the ancient Greek or the way that, uh, you know, I don't know, some other work of art might for some other uh, culture, right? The Greek tragedy for, for some of the Greeks, okay? Um, again, 
if it is still relevant, how is it relevant? We need to figure that out. How is art still relevant in society? You might look to these shepherd fairy, uh, you know, this is art, right? This is a part of our world. We live in a world where art is on the streets, right? Not in the galleries, right? It's raw, it's real, it's visceral. This is sort of a, you know, a statement of our times. This reveals a world, right? Maybe art is still relevant in this sense. Maybe Heidegger's, he, he's got, there's some hope for Heidegger, right? Maybe it's still relevant, but maybe it's not. How many of y'all have ever heard of any of these artists I've mentioned, right? Sure, you probably heard of Picasso and maybe Jackson Pollock and some of the famous ones, but throughout this whole series, right? How many of these, uh, these artists and works of art have you heard of, right? I'm a nerd, I like, I like art, right? But, you know, people don't realize that when Michelangelo unveiled the David, everyone was there. I mean, it was like, a, you know, the Super Bowl. You didn't miss it, okay? How many people go to art openings? Whenever there's a symphony that's, that's composed and performed for the first time, how many people know that that's the case? Houston Symphony, beautiful, wonderful, world-class symphony. They do premieres every year, right? Sometimes several times a year. You know, they'll have a world premiere of a piece of a modern-day composer. You ever heard of any, mo can, you name, can you name one modern-day composer? But you might say, well, those are old, outdated works of art. You know, classical music is no longer relevant now. People are into rock and roll, hip hop, whatever. And so those are relevant. But think about it, right? How, how long has rock and roll been around? You know, since the late 50s, 1950s? And it's already pretty much dead. I mean, in my mind, that's, that's, that's debatable, right? But I mean, it's, it's kind of like not the thing it used to be. It's not as big as it used to be. Now hip hop is the big thing. Who knows what's next, right? How long is hip hop? So hip hop, hip hop's only been around since the 1980s, right? So, you know, is you know maybe these worlds that Heidegger speaks of keep changing, right? It's just changing at such a rapid pace, right? I don't know. Maybe maybe this is a problem with with our, our understanding. Of that. To try to tie it together in general to the course, right? Why do I give a crap about art? Why should you give a crap about art? Well, because I really do think that. Um, whether it's Heidegger or Dewey or Nietzsche, some of these, these last three philosophers we've looked at, and even Kant, right, to, to a certain extent. Art is important, man. Like, art is something that we should be proud of. The fact that we create art is something that's, like, kind of unique about human beings. I know there's a lot of people out there that don't like humans, right? We're so bad. We're so evil. I like animals better. I'd, I'd rather kill a person than kill an animal. I've heard that before. Um, yeah, we're pretty rotten. We are pretty rotten. Um, we've done some pretty horrible things. But we made art, you know? That's freaking amazing, man. Like, that's really, there, there's no purpose for it. And yet we do it anyway. Why? It's beautiful, right? Maybe there is a purpose, though, right? Maybe there is something significant about it, right? If we allow it to be what it is, right? It is art. It's aesthetic. And really, when I, I, I'm, I guess I'm sort of revealing my inner Nietzsche in here. Um, it's all aesthetics, Everything's aesthetics, right? Sorry, sorry, scientists. Sorry, math. Maybe math. Maybe you math guys are are, are, are off the hook. Math, math might not be aesthetics. Maybe it is though. I you know the math is beautiful, right? That whole camp, right? I'm not in that camp, by the way. But yeah, maybe, maybe even math is is aesthetic, right? But for me, you know, sociological theories, uh, political theories. They have a certain aesthetic appeal, whether we want to admit it or not. We call them rational, correct, true, right? But I think we're not quite aware of how deeply we, affect, we are affected by the aesthetics of things, how it appeals to us, right? How it appeals to us and how we enjoy it. And so I think that a lot of this cognitive dissonance that we have, this inability to see things, right? It has a lot to do with that sort of show that, 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 uh, uh, that Plato's talking about in the cave to bring it back to the very beginning of the semester. We're talking about Plato's allegory of the cave, right? In a sense, we're always going to be stuck in the cave. No matter how much philosophy we do or how much theorizing we do, we'll be stuck in the cave, right? We're always going to be seeing the world in some imperfect and shadow-like way, right? Like Heidegger says, right? Truth is untruth, right? All truth is going to cast sort of a shadow on all other sort of truth to reveal something something else has to be covered up okay 
aesthetics is a sort of way of presenting things, okay? And aesthetics is a sort of way of being and a way of dwelling in things, right? I keep talking like Heidegger here. I'm trying to segue out of this. So that's why art is important to me, right? Art is the space we dwell in. Art, you can think of your life as a work of art, I guess you could say, right? And so if you never step back to think about what kind of art am I making? What kind of painting am I painting? What kind of picture am I drawing? What kind of movie am I directing? And that's a very personal way of looking at it. More importantly, we should step back and say, what are we making together, right? This is not some one act play by one person, one actor, a monologue. This is a dialogue. This, is, this involves a whole bunch of stage hands, lighting, and technicians, right? What are we creating here? What are we doing together, right? In one of Plato's, or sorry, one of Heidegger's essays, he quotes a, a line from a Holderlin poem. Man is the sign that is not read. What's a sign? Right, a street sign is something that we read for directions. Stop. Museum, 10 miles that way. We read a sign, right? But we're, we are a sign. Man, humans, human beings, we're a sign. If you look at us, we point to something. We signal to something, right? But as Holderlin puts it, we're a sign that's not read. Art forces us, I want to argue, and I'm kind of with Heidegger on this, art forces us to read that sign, to step back and reflect on our world, right? And in a sense, to see our world itself as a product of aesthetics. Right? And to ask ourselves, is this the painting we want to paint? Is this the picture that we want to draw? Is this the movie we want to direct? Are there other ways we could direct it, right? So that's why I think art is important. And that's why I think studying art, understanding art and aesthetics is important, right? Political, social, psychological, all sorts of reasons, right? If we're ever going to solve our problems, right, it's not going to be an easy thing to do by calculating it, putting it in a formula and explaining to somebody in some, you know, long drawn out book with, you know, point A, point B, point C. If you have this aesthetic presentation, this visceral sort of, you know, this, it's, it's a more direct and more effective way, I think, of revealing the way the world is to people and then revealing the way the world can be. So I've already rambled on, I think enough here. Those of you who are just watching it for Heidegger probably stopped watching a long time ago. But if you're one of my students at the University of Houston, I'm really glad you took this class. It's my first semester teaching it. I got a lot of pleasure out of teaching it. Probably a little bit too much pleasure. You see the, the length of some of these videos. I got a little carried away. Um, but I'm really glad that you were here. I'm sorry that everything had to happen with the COVID-19. Uh, this is really crummy. I really hate the fact that I'm teaching this online the first time, at least half the semester was online. I love being engaged in the middle of the classroom and, 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 and really seeing how this material works itself out in that context. So hopefully next semester we'll get a chance to do that. You know, some of my, my future students, you know, they'll be able to benefit from these videos. But for those of you who are just here for the ride, you know, that's awesome. Thanks for sticking around to the end of this video. I know this was a long video, but I had a lot to do to finish up. It's been a fun ride. Thanks for checking us out. I've got more material probably coming down in the woodworks. I'm probably going to put a, my uh, world religions class up here this summer. So you got that to look forward to. So if you haven't already subscribe, hit like all that good stuff. And um, you know, thanks a lot. Hope to see you guys on the other side. Cheers.